Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I'd like to introduce uh, Steve Hammond, Dr. Steve Hammond. He is the director of the Computational Science Center at the National Renewable Energy Labs in Golden, Colorado. There he leads the NREL High Performance Computing, Computational Science, and Energy Efficient Data Center activities. Prior to that, uh, he was the uh, uh, he was with 10 years with the Atmospheric Research Center in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, he has a PhD in Computational Science from, if I pronounce this wrong, correct me, Resslier. RPI. That? RPI. There we go. Thank you. Uh, and a Master's in Science from uh, Rochester. Steve. Thank you very much, John. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to come and speak today. I also have another colleague who's hiding in the back, Mike Robinson. He's the, he's the Deputy Director of the National Wind Technology Center at NREL. Um, so what I want to talk about today is a little overview of the lab. It's sort of a 30,000-foot view. I think a lot of folks haven't heard of the National Renewable Energy Lab before, and then sort of trans transition a bit to sort of environmental conditions and um, how um, renewable energy, energy efficiency, how that interplays with uh, computing. Um, so we're part of the Department of Energy's uh, lab complex. You may have heard of Los Alamos or uh, Livermore, which is the weapons labs. Um, then there's the Office of Science labs, including Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, Oak Ridge, Argonne, et cetera. So we're part of the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, so it's a different office, and we're located in Golden, Colorado, just uh, west of Denver. And we've been uh, a national lab for the last 30 years, so we're one of the, actually, the, one of the newer labs, and we're the only national lab dedicated to uh, research in renewable energy and energy efficiency. Um, our research spans fundamental science out to technological solutions and systems integration issues, we have close collaborations with universities and with industry, lots of CRADAs. Um, uh, the research is, is very um, sort of use-inspired or market-relevant. Um, just for size-wise, our annual budget is about $500 million a year, um, which has doubled uh, recently, and about 2,200, uh, if you count every nose. Um, historically, our, our funding has fluctuated, and you can probably pick out your favorite or least favorite administration. Um, but it started under the Carter administration, uh, uh, grew rapidly, grew again under Clinton administration, and has grown starting in 2006 with a change in Congress. Um, uh, so as you can see here, we've, we've doubled in size in the last three years in, in our budget. Um, we're growing rapidly. Um, we've got more or less a building a year plan, which is creating um, interesting dynamics on campus, but it's, it's an exciting time to be at the lab. That's the stimulus funds. So, so our sponsor, the Office of Energy Efficiency Renewable Energy, their annual budget is about $1.6 billion a year. And we're their only lab, and we get, you know, order two or three million dollars, two or three hundred million dollars a year from them. And uh, their part of the stimulus package was about 16 billion. So they got 10 years worth of funding to spend in 18 months. And a lot of that's to weatherization, you know, it sort of passed through for, you know, smart grid installation of hardware, um, weatherization, and, and some of that is going to sort of uh, restructure, reorient our, the infrastructure for our campus. Um, we have two primary business lines from the research standpoint. So there's, there's a whole part of the organization that focuses on renewable electricity and related activities. So that includes solar, that's PV and concentrated um, solar, wind and wave energy, um, geothermal uh, energy, and then buildings and electric systems. Um, a lot of our work goes beyond individual devices or solutions, but looking at, at whole integrated um, systems. Um, the other part of the lab focuses on renewable fuels. Um, so that's biofuels, hydrogen production, storage, fuel cells, and vehicle systems, and everything from auxiliary loads like um, more efficient um, auto air conditioners or um, you know, how to, how to 
uh, more efficiently provide creature comforts within the vehicle. Like 10% of our imported fuels goes just to operating um, air conditioning within vehicles. Um, so within those, we also include work on energy efficiency aspects. But we really span from basic research to integrated uh, systems. We have, I'm part of the um, energy, system, energy sciences uh, directorate, which is within the foundational science effort. We also have a, a significant effort in strategic energy analysis, looking at policy decisions and impacts. And then we have a relatively newer part of the organization looking at commercialization and deployment, taking the, the ideas and um, technologies developed at the laboratory and making sure that there are industry partners that are ready to receive them. So we're home to the uh, National Center for Photovoltaics Research. Um, and so we, we do research in fundamental materials um, for photovoltaics as well as like solar thermal materials um, for concentrated solar systems. Um, there's about uh, 1.1 gigawatts of installed capacity in the U.S. Uh, for uh, photovoltaics. That's grown by 43% since 2007. The cost is about 18 to 23 percent, or 18 to 23 cents per kilowatt hour. So that's the levelized cost of electricity. So that includes installation, maintenance, uh, any uh, um, tax credits. In concentrated solar, um, is about half of that. Uh, I think it's actually closer to 430 megawatts currently. Two, 2008 is the best data that we have. It's it's uh, often hard to get that from manufacturers. Um, so we've got. 95% uh, of the global capacity in, in concentrated solar here in the U.S. There's a, a couple big um, farms in Spain, but other than that, it's really um, Arizona and the Southwest. Why is that? I, I don't know why. I mean, it's sort of been pioneered and pushed within the U.S. Um, we've got really um, ideal res solar resources for that. Um, but you know, here's a here's a picture of. of concentrated solar. So think of a trough and they, they run molten salts through it. Um, it. One of the advantages of concentrated solar is it provides a little bit of storage because you get the thermal, the latent heat that resides in that system. But they're big. I mean, you can see people sitting there. Is it because maybe technically it's more difficult to deploy? I mean, if you're using it's salts, it's kind of interesting that it's so focused on it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, PV, we're not we're not the leaders at all. Yeah. The country, so we got 90% of the market. So the the DOE has certain the Department of Energy has certain energy targets they're looking at. So they're trying to get um, basically by 2017, 2015, somewhere in that range. They want PV to be cost effective, cost competitive with other sources of, of general electricity, and CSP as well. So they're trying to trying to push these technologies. To, so that that's that includes um, feed-in tariffs. It includes everything. Right? So does the cost also, also include the the, up, the amortized equipment costs? So if they need to yes, the it's it's total, you know, levelized cost of electricity from this source. So the the research thrust that we have in in solar. Um, spans both from, from new materials and applications, advanced manufacturing techniques. I mean, the, the cost of PV is, is really diffuse. So it does, it's the materials themselves, with, you know, polysilicon, and that sort of fluctuates. There's actually more polysilicon used in photovoltaics than in the IT industry. So more silicon goes into PV than to computer chips right now. And that, cro that crossed, I think they crossed that threshold in about 2007. Um, so we focus on advanced manufacturing techniques and lowering the costs so we get higher volumes at, at sort of commodity type pricing. Um, concentrated solar, again, we're looking at novel materials um, for more efficient um, capturing of that heat and then and for storing it. This is a picture of a big solar array in um, southern Colorado. Another active area that we have is in buildings. Um, buildings are uh, significant interest because so much of, of our electricity goes to buildings. It's 39% of our energy uh, consumed is in buildings. It's 71% of our electricity goes to buildings. 38% of our carbon emissions can be traced back to buildings. 
So DOE's goal is to have um, cost-effective, market, marketable zero-energy buildings by 2025. Um, I'll, in a few minutes, I'll show you one of the uh, new buildings we have on campus, which is a net zero-energy building. It was just uh, completed this year. So we're, our focus is really on whole building systems, integration of renewables into them, architectural features, how to approach buildings so that they're from scratch designed to be energy efficient. Oh, sorry, next slide, sorry. So we have a new facility that was just built. It's a uh, more or less administrative building. It's a 22,000 square foot office building. We're moving staff out of leased space into that building as we speak. It's probably two thirds occupied right now. And it's, it's the first federally funded net zero energy building. Um, we tend to try to do things so we walk the talk. So this building is a showcase facility. Um, it's construction costs at $260 per square foot is similar to other buildings in the area. Um, energy usage in particular is the 35 kBTUs per square foot per year. Um, and this includes a 1,000 square foot, it's an IT data center where, where our IT folks maintain you know, mail and storage and our web presence and all. Um, that's just 49% of the energy usage of a typical building. Um, we use extensive, uh, um, use of passive heating, cooling, daylighting. I'll show you how that, how that looks for us. Um, and it's anticipated that we'll save 3,000 tons of carbon equivalent emissions per year. And one of the things we, we noted when we were trying to make this building energy efficient was that personal habits represent about a third of what a typical building uses in its, in its energy. It's, it's the computer you have, it's the monitor you have, it's the, you know, the lighting in your office environment, um, you know, whether or not you've got a little you know, APC you know, battery unit you know, backup uh, uh, for your desktop. You know, so one of the things we've done is, you know, printers, scanners. No one can have a printer or scanner in their office space. There's, there, those services become centralized. Um, uh, we don't have any desk side systems there. They're all laptops because the, we just paid attention to every, every bit of uh, energy usage. Steve, let me ask a question. Not sure. Statistics. You said it's net zero energy, but that's only from a heating and cooling perspective. So 39% of the average U.S. building, that's including all the stuff you plug in? Is that that's everything. Okay. But the, but, Whole envelope. But if you had no computers and people in there to maintain temperature, it would be net zero energy. Is that, it's net zero with, with people, with, with everything. On annual. It's net zero with everything included? Yes. But then how do you decrease third? Wouldn't it be 100% less? energy use than a typical office building. That's what I'm thinking. No, no, no. So we've got, so we've reduced the energy usage to 39% of a typical building for everything, with the people, you know, lights, how they, how they run their computing equipment. And then we, we supply that with photovoltaics. So we meet the energy oh. needs. So it's a net zero energy building. So it's, oh, okay. it's able to generate as much as it needs. So you've designed it more efficiently and the power it does need from yes. Gotcha. Yeah. So how much extra space you have to use for the, the PVs? I don't know exactly, but it's not all rooftop on this building. It's, it's on adjacent um, uh, parking garage. Okay. So, so one of the things of these buildings is if, if you take an aerial view of our campus, our buildings tend to have a 60-foot span north to south so they can be daylit. Okay, and the, and the spans are separated such that, you know, um, we can get daylighting through most of the year. Okay, so we don't need to turn lights on. And um, so, I mean, the, the energy usage is equivalent to about, you know, five light bulbs, five 60-watt light bulbs. Um, and one of the things we found was for every watt that we save, it's $33 less PV we need to install. So there were significant incentives to... To do there, so it's a, it's a, and it's a beautiful building. It's not just this sort of odd oddity that you can say, "Well, I work in the RSF, and uh, we're adding another wing to it off off the north to add another 400 people, so it'll it'll um, house 1,200 people. So there's about 400 people per per wing, 100 people per floor, each of the four floors. Yes. How do you heat the building? So the the building is largely heated through passive solar. 
There's a labyrinth in the basement. It, um, there's a, it, it absorbs heat during the daytime. I mean, we have tremendous solar potential in our area. We've got, um, I can't remember the last day it rained like this, but um, we've got lots of solar resources that heat the building. It's captured. We've got a, a labyrinth in the basement that, that pulls in warm air um, during the, as needed, stored, and then, then recirculated. So it's all it's more or less all radiant radiant heat. Um, in the renewable fuels area, um, we have a, a very large effort in looking at cellulosic ethanol. This is a in um, cellulase, which is an enzyme that exists in nature. I think it was discovered in the Marshall Islands during World War II. It was breaking down tents and um, parachutes and ropes and stuff, and they've isolated it, and we're looking at sort of how we can modify this enzyme to better break down cellulose, which is the woody, the wood parts of plants, um, to extract the sugars that are then fermented into fuels. So it's a, a big focus at the lab of, of not using cornstarch, which is the corn kernels, um, which is a, the current uh, way that we get um, uh, our fuels, and we want to use the, the woody parts, basically agricultural and uh, forestry byproducts um, to create the fuels. Um, we also look at hydrogen production. So this is looking at algal fuels, um, both diesel and, and otherwise. Um, do a lot of, a lot of modeling, um, looking at how um, these uh, algae exist, how they use the oxygen, and they, how they uh, generate uh, hydrogen. So a lot of molecular dynamics. So probably we do more biological uh, molecular dynamic simulations than we do in, in our materials. And again, looking at, at vehicle systems, everything from um, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, um, scenarios for electrification of our transportation system and what it would mean with, with a million or more plug-in hybrid electric vehicles and using that as actually utility scale energy storage. So trying to integrate all these things together to um, allow us to use uh, renewables. I think I talked about that on the fuel side. Okay. Um, on the HPC side, we have a new building that's um, going to be planned to be completed in 2012. It'll sort of serve a dual uh, purpose. It'll house our HPC capabilities, um, and it'll be a showcase facility for energy efficiency in data centers. Um, Again, the 60-foot span north to south. This is um, sort of looking from the southwest, looking northeast. So there's office space for about 200 people, solar on the roof here, here, and here. A data center here, about 10,000 square feet of raised floor. Here's a switch yard. Here's evaporative cooling. And this is high bay area looking at power electronics, fuel cells, um, and integration of renewables in the grid. And it's called the Energy System Integration Facility. Um, It'll be completed late in 2012. Um, it's designed to be the world's most energy efficient data center. I think Christian would take issue with that with his um, data center and tent. But um, from an HPC standpoint, um, it's really just pumps and fans. Um, so we're not using any mechanical cooling. We're sort of setting design points for the manufacturers that we're going to extract 90% of the heat, the waste heat through liquid means. Um, we're going to recirculate that. Um, waste heat through the building to use that for um, heating in the cold, um, colder months, and it's anticipated that we'll be able to, to sh um, export that to other buildings to, to use that. Um, so I, th I think that's um, So I'm, I'm going to shift a bit now and talk sort of about sort of where things are headed and sort of why you should care and what, what the uh, what the computing industry worries about or should worry about. Um, and data centers themselves have been growing, as, as you would know here, um, but their energy footprint is growing significantly. Um, I think as of right now, the EPA study talks about um, energy use in the data centers. I think at, at this point it's about 3%, just around 3% of the total electrical supply is consumed in data centers. And it's not a lot, but it's it's doubled in the last sort of four or five years, and it's expected to double again in four or five years. So it's sort of got its own Moore's law, if you will. So it's going to be a very significant portion of our utility use if this continues. Um, and the EPA is very concerned about this because largely our electricity is a, is a carbon producer. 
So if, if there is some form of, of carbon sequestration or an outright carbon tax or, or some sort of carbon cap, odds are that our electricity costs are going to go up. And I don't know um, about you, but I'm, I'm very concerned about this from the cost of our data center because we pay about a million dollars a megawatt on an annual basis. Um, some folks are advocating a carbon tax of about $15 per ton per year. So that's, and that would increase by $10 per year. So if, from the IT industry standpoint, if there was a $15 per ton per year tax and you draw a megawatt of power at your data center, that would be almost $100,000. If, if you've got a 10 megawatt, that's about a million dollars. Okay, that's just sort of the going in price. And as that goes up, so if you've got you know, 100 megawatt data center, that's, that's $10 million of operating costs that, that you're gonna see. So that, that's gonna shift things. So um, if you can do things more efficiently, then you have a competitive advantage. What, what year are they thinking? Oh, I don't, I, I would have, so, you know, I thought we were gonna have an energy bill. And it just hasn't worked out. So I, I don't know. I mean, the, the politics are just really squirrely. There's, there's no leadership on either side saying that we have to get serious about climate. See, from our standpoint, we're trying to get a sense for how likely it is to hit, because if, if there is dates against it, then we can right. put that into our cost equations and, then it's, it's, and so the speculate is, when we should invest in this. My experience is people tend to do things for two reasons. I mean, they're, they're fairly beholden to the status quo. And they do things because there's either a great opportunity or there's some impending disaster. And with climate, there's no identification of either one right now. You know, the impending disaster still looks 10 years away. So unfortunately by, you know, and tell you, I spent 10 years developing climate models. Um, and, I, and I changed jobs, I, I came to NREL in 2002 because we didn't, I didn't think we needed another decimal place of accuracy on how things are headed. I wanted to do something about it, right? So th there's no impending train wreck yet. And there's no, and until we identify the, 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 the better opportunity, people aren't gonna do things. So, you know, it, it's not, it hasn't risen to the level where people are gonna take some action. You know, until we get some major rapid change, rapid climate change of some sort, or we get a, you know, a die off somewhere of some species. So. And unfortunately, by that time, it's probably too late. You, know, you think of this giant flywheel. You know, and you're, it's, you know, the energy and the system momentum is just too great. So, I mean, if we really wanted to make a difference, we'd have to start, you know, yesterday. So, so when you start to look at energy and computing, you, yeah. For carbon tax, if, I mean, I guess, currently, I don't know, it's X percent of your energy is being produced from renewables, right? So it makes sense. Bulk of the production is coming from coal or other non renewables yes. But once that equation changes, right? So would you would would the the carbon taxes be applicable only to the part which is coming from non renewables, or even even if your energy is coming from a renewable source, you would still the, the intent is it will still be charged. So unless you're completely off grid, which is the only way to isolate yourself, then if, if you're utility supplier probably has a mix of things, which is fairly typical. So depending on whether it's part coal, part natural gas, part nuclear, so, so your rates will depend on, on what that mix is. Here in the Northwest, we have a lot of water resources. So most of our electricity from heat to energy comes from that. Um, so we would have a different equation, I think. Mm -hmm. But I think, I mean, hydro is largely tapped out. I mean, there aren't a lot of new... Right, but we're lucky we've got yeah. right here, and they're not taking down all the dams yet, so... Um. Yeah. So, so when you start to take a, a larger look at energy and computing, you really need, you know, new solu integrated solutions that aren't just, um, you know, point-wise. There's no real silver bullet. So we need new approach to chips, you know, boards, servers, software, right? How, how we design our algorithms, how we design our software has a big impact on the, the power we consume. Um, and, and the data centers, it's not, you know, our approach to our new data center is, was, we're experts in, in energy efficient buildings. 
And so we've defined set points for where we find the sweet spot and told the, the computer, so we try to find the interface of how we get our buildings to operate efficiently from a holistic view with our HPC systems. So it's really saying we want to supply 75 degree water in the summer because that's as cool as we can get it with tower water and in the winter because we want to. So it's in the summertime because we have to, in the wintertime because we want to. And we want a 20 degree delta T through these liquid cooled systems. So we can, because 95 degree water is useful. You know, 80 degree air out the back of a computer is, is not very um, helpful at all. So we got to, you know, break down the stove piping. And I, um, I gave a talk like this to, to Intel just over a year ago. I was, in, I was their keynote speaker at the Intel Fellows, their power conference. And I joke, it was the only time I've given a talk at a conference I wasn't allowed to attend. They ushered me in and I, I spoke for an hour and I got to leave because it was, you know, company held. But I was saying, you, you've got to think outside the box. It's, you know, look at the whole product life cycle. You know, if you've got an energy efficient computer but you ship it in styrofoam peanuts and it comes from somewhere in Asia and, and there's no way to recycle its apartments, its, its components, you've failed. You know, look at how it's recharged. Look at what you can do to recycle it. Um, look at the whole thing. And, and at commodity volumes, small changes in, in products have, have a huge impact. You know, it's, it's about personal electronics to PCs all the way to the largest data centers. Okay. There's, there's a very interesting report about gadgets to gigawatts that reviews usage patterns and energy efficiency in personal electronics. Because that's, you know, you know I, I know if, I suspect your house is similar to mine. You walk around at night and you see all these little, you know, green LEDs or something on the printer. There's something on your chargers. There's, you know, your, your VCR, your cable box. Everything's sort of got a little, little light. I'm here. You know? so, so think about that. I mean, there are, so what I was challenging Intel, saying there's a billion PCs in the world, and I, I suspect 80% of those are yours. And if you saved one watt per, C, per PC, that's twice the Bonneville Dam. Right? That's a gigawatt. There's a lot of energy to be saved. Just, just one simple design change to lower a watt. Right? That, that's huge. So small changes whether it's in the software algorithms you make in the software, you know, the operating system, um, you know, the applications that people run, you know, make huge differences. And I'm, with all due respect, I'm probably in the wrong, wrong place, but I was, when I was talking to the Intel folks, I was saying, you know, who's gonna develop the Prius of PCs? You know, I've got the little incandescent light bulb on, so how are you gonna do this? We, you know, why, why don't we have a 10 watt PC? I mean, how, how many people have, you know, a, you know, 90 watt or 120 watt PC on their desk side, and what they do is, is you're running Excel spreadsheets, and so you don't, you just don't need all that. You don't need all that power. I mean, I'm, when I've talked to the Apple folks, I said, it, you know, it's nice that the little Mac Mini, and we've got one at home, and I had my graphics guy tainted green, but I said 13 watts idle is, is, is the step in the right direction, but make it less than 10. And if you're going to do that, you know, combine it with an OLED monitor so you've got really low power usage and, you know, so you don't, I mean, this is really warm. It doesn't, doesn't have to be. So I figure if, if Apple can get you to pay $400 for a phone with flaky coverage, they can get you to buy something like this that's actually good for the planet. Okay? So you can, you know, just take the guts of a, of a you know, of your favorite notebook and, and, package it differently and then you've got this nice packaging because I don't need graphics accelerators and all this other stuff. I'm not a, I'm not a gamer. I just, you know, my kids want to update Facebook and, you know, you know, chat with their friends and stuff and that's really all that's needed. Um, so, you know, repackage your, your PC and do that and then you've got a nice package and then when, you know, when the motherboard or you need more memory, you bring it in and they, they swap out some components and, and you can continue to use that without throwing stuff away. So, so our approach to servers is we want bytes and BTUs. So, so we really we want the warmth that they produce because we're paid for we paid you know prime dollars for the electricity we're buying. Um, and when we're not using them, and, and you know our IT you know has the same you know cycles that I'm sure most companies have. It's you know used during the day, and some of our stuff you know our mail servers and firewall and web stuff just goes off. So we want really low power mode. Because otherwise, 
you know, if they're not being used, they're still using like 70% of the electricity that they use as if they're running full out. Um, to the Intel folks who are saying, we want intelligent multi-core systems, automatically adopt the power consumption to the demand. Um, our, historically in the HPC arena, there's been high density systems, you know, hot, very power dense systems, but they require liquid cooling and mechanical systems to, to achieve that. Or they've got low density systems that have, they want coal air coming in and they've got warm air out the back. And we, we have to do a better job of just getting the heat to the back of the rack and declaring mission accomplished. We, we can do better. So our approach is to say we want some combination of this where we want a dense enough system and we want to cool. And we don't really want to cool the system. We want to keep it from overheating because I want, I want that waste heat out the back because I can use it. Um, our total cost of ownership for this new building is going to be exceptionally low and we don't need to buy all these things. So it's cheaper to build up front and very cheap to operate. So I've said very little about wind to, um, so far, I'm, but I, I think you know, wind is probably in the best position to supply energy for, um, for computing. When I look ahead to big data centers, to, to integration into the grid, it's probably the most mature. Um, I know in places in Colorado, you know, wind provides the, the cheapest source of electrons into the grid. Um, if, if you remember from solar, I said there was about one gigawatt. So there's, maybe 25 gigawatts. So it's about 25x the installed capacity of wind relative to solar. Um, you know, wind resources are, are throughout the U.S. Um, the, the installed capacity has tripled since 2006. According to NERC, there's about another 145 gigawatts um, in various stages of planning. You know, not all of that will see the market, will, will reach market, but there's a, a lot of interest in wind. So we're, we're home to the National Wind Technology Center. Um, for the Department of Energy. Long-term potential, there are plans to, to supply 25% of the U.S. electrical supply by 2025. Um, that's about 3,000 uh, or 300, 300 gigawatts or 300,000 megawatts of additional um, capability coming in or if you think of individual turbines, about 120,000 new turbines. And these are, yeah, these are, these are big systems. I mean, so the, the you know, blades are, you know, 40 meters or longer. You know, you stand next to them, the, you know, the towers are, are big. I mean, you can have elevators inside them. It, it's a really big system. How close are, are we to hitting the potential? I think we're less than, I mean, we're right around 2 to 3% of electrical supply now. So we're, you know, a factor of 10 away from where we could be. And to be honest, the, I think one of the biggest impediments is that to, transmission distribution system. We don't need, you know, in any of these things in terms of producing electricity from sunlight or wind or, you know, fuels from crops, it's, it's not, we don't need a new, um, you know, a miracle here or there. Right? It's just, it's sort of a national will of, of how much and when. And there are costs associated with it, but unfortunately we're seeing that we bear the total cost of this, whereas other other forms of energy are, are subsidized. They don't. We don't see the total cost. Is the U.S. on track to get that? I, I don't know. To be, to be honest, I mean it's 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 far enough away. It, it's hard. I didn't know if the build rate, the current build rate, would come out fair or not. The current build rate will get there, but there's so much that can happen between between now and then because you, you're going to run into stumbling blocks, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, last night, which was the whole idea that if we do that, you will impact the other patterns. Yeah, um, is I, that, I can. Is that you not? can ask. <laughs> you can ask. I can ask. So, so this is why well, I think this is interesting. I've been thinking about this for, for a couple of years. I mean, here's here's the wind resource map. So as, as you get towards red and blue, you get you know, superb, outstanding. These have to do with, you know, sort of the rates of, of winds, you know, the wind speed and, and whether it's turbulent or not. So it's, it's, how, it's our ability to extract the winds at, at a certain elevation. And then through the Midwest. Okay, there's the, the Texas Panhandle, T. Boone Pickens, um, starting to put lots of wind turbines there. You know, here's the uh, Northeast Coast, you know, Cape Wind project out there. You've probably heard of the folks in Martha's Vineyard who don't want, you know, wind turbines and um, the shoals there, but there's, there's a lot of great 
resources available for wind. And you can plan around it. The land requirements aren't that great, so or aren't that huge. So there's a lot of opportunities for wind. And if, and if you couple that with the Green Grids uh, has produced this map of free, free air cooling. So where could you have computers located that don't need mechanical systems that you, you could operate in a tent outside or just you know, in some enclosure that keeps you know, sort of weather off and critters out? You see this, you know, again, Midwest. You see this in the Great Lakes you know, along the coast. So, so if you take where you could locate computers without large mechanical systems, so you, have, you sort of destroy the notion of a data center, so you more or less think of things stuffed inside of, of a shipping container with, you know, bring in, you know, electricity and you bring in, you know, some fans to bring in air to keep them from overheating. You can really put them, put them anywhere. And there's an ideal match between, you know, computing that it needs power in and you get, you know, you know bits out. I mean, you don't need many natural resources. It's, it's sensitive to water. You don't need water. So in, in terms of an industry, you can sort of locate your compute data centers wherever. And, and I think traditionally it's been located wherever you can get good, you know, purchase power agreements. It's actually even better than that because that's the green grid showing it at 81 Fahrenheit. Oh, yeah. It's the more driving server temperatures. As, as, we're, as you drive them up, it gets, it gets absolutely much lower down. down. But, but the point is that, you know, there's a high overlap between where we have wind resources and where we can get, you know, free air cooling where you don't need to, you know, use chillers. So if you get rid of this big infrastructure, you don't need these big warehouses. You just, you know, r roll up on an 18-wheeler and drop off your, your container. And so it, it sort of destroys the notion. You know, we've, we've seen where we had, you know, commodity processors to commodity, you know, parts to, I mean, commodity servers. Let's get rid of the data. Let's commoditize the data center and just make it a, a commodity volume. Yeah. Have you had the variance the amount of energy you get from wind to put a data center in? So let me, let me see if I, if I don't answer the question in the next couple slides, I'll come back to it, okay? Do you have an overlay of that with where the major data centers are for, for industry and government? I don't know. I mean, we're, I mean so, so all, here... The in, ones I know of are all in green and yellow areas. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, nation's capital there, a bunch of the labs, there's you know, Argonne National Lab there, you know, we reside here, but also the National Center for Research, Research. There's a lot of you know, federal labs in around the Denver metro area. Um, but where the, where the, I suspect there's more power used in sort of the, you know, the cloud than in the federal data centers. Right? You know, Facebook, Yahoo, you know, Microsoft, there's a G company, Apple, you know, Lots of data centers here, big, that use more power than sort of the federal data centers. Um, but I, I don't know about, you know, where they all sit. I mean, there may be other reasons, but, but as, as electricity costs are going up, I mean, this is going to be an important thing to figure out where, and, and if you can put your data centers wherever, I think it's going to be a, a real estate issue, you know, location, location, location. And where, do, where can you put them? Yeah, it's with uh, Rich. You put the data center where you can take advantage of free air cooling almost all year round. You can save just on construction costs, you can save 25%. Yeah, we, right? we're, we're, for our new facility and data center, we're going to do a white paper comparing what we would have done if it was a traditional data center and, and the costs. And what we're seeing, you know, mil, you know ten, probably $10 million savings in construction costs for a, for a relatively small data center. It's, it's 10 megawatts. But it's all evaporative cooling. Also, 25% savings on energy costs. On an, and the annual costs we're, we're saving. Because all, well, it's even better than that because we're reusing that waste. Yeah. So we're not only we're, we're using very little extraneous power to to cool the system and conversions, and then with the power we are using, you know, all the waste heat we're, we're capturing and using that within this building and others. So you know, probably uh, two or three million dollars a year annual savings, not for the cost. So do you assume you can um, get network wherever you want with low cost? So, so one of the benefits, I won't say you can get it wherever you want, but one of the benefits of the dot-com bubble that burst was there was a lot of fiber put in. So there's, there's a, a lot, there's actually more fiber around than there is transmission distribution system for the electrical. There's less politics involved in putting uh, fiber down versus yeah. 
Prince. I mean, I mean, fiber is small and cheap and it's easy to install. Very. Yeah. It's, it's hidden. So here's, let me, so humor me for a couple minutes. We, so a, a typical, you know, wind plant. I'm just gonna, with a, with a bit of a cartoon. So you you install your wind turbines, and then based on your anticipated wind generating capacity, you have to have a transmission and um, distribution system. You have to have the infrastructure set up to, to carry that away. So you need step up transformers um, to bring it up to the grid, and then transmission and distribution system for, for long distance um, carrying of your your electrical. So everything is sort of matched, okay? But if, if the wind, um, generates more, then you're stuck. Right? If, you, if you've got a, a prime wind day, you've got to spill that wind. But this, this is sort of a traditional setup with everything um, sort of balanced uh, with the carrying capacity to meet the generating capacity. So if, if you then decided to locate a data center there, and I, I mean the numbers can vary depending on what scenarios you wanted to look at, but, but if you had your installed capacity of 200 megawatts and you had a 100 megawatt data center, you could actually save through here. You wouldn't need the same size step-up transformer because you're going to steal the first 100 megawatts out of, out of the, what the, that the wind generates. And your transmission and distribution system, which is often a bottleneck, doesn't need to be as big. Okay? So you can get economies of scale in, in, gener in installing the wind turbines without all this back-end infrastructure that you need. And it's, it's clear it's, it's cheaper to move. I mean, the losses through the transmission and distribution system is about 9%. Oh gosh, so capacity factor, it depends on where you are and, and your topography, but it could be, you know, 20 to 30 percent. It's 30 percent over here in Washington. 30 percent. So it never goes to zero. Oh, it does go to zero. No, no I'm saying, so of, of the peak, so, of, so for example, if you, if you buy a, uh, and we, we have a couple of turbines, we've got a one, one and a half and a 2.3 megawatt turbine, you know, and they're big, big systems. So they will probably in our site because we got very poor quality wind, but it's meant for life cycle testing. Um, I mean, it'll, it'll, there are days when it just drops to zero, but on average, they look at that and it's it's about you know probably twenty percent. So, so for that, yeah, so general purpose data center, you need the arrows going the other way to red. But that's it is by direction. Yeah. So I mean, once once you plug in, it's by direction, right? So suppose you've got no wind being generated. You so you've got this infrastructure that's your 100 megawatts, but you've got to get that the 100 megawatts that's coming from somewhere. Okay, so it comes back in from the grid, but you know we, we've had lots of discussions about well, are the utility companies going to charge you a premium? Right? Are you going to get reamed because you're then pulling back from the grid, whereas in you know, in this scenario, you're exporting 100 megawatts, and somebody's depending on that. Yeah. And if in this scenario, with no wind, it fits just slack. But, okay. but you know, I can imagine scenarios in which the sort of capacity of the transmission lines would have to be larger to sort of accommodate the, the extra flow that didn't get handled locally in, in your previous picture. Yeah, it all, you, have, you have to find the right balance, and you look at your... your you have to look at the economics to decide how they could, and whether you want, you know, closely, you know, co-located data centers with um, your generation, whether it makes sense to have, you know, what the unit size, whether it's a megawatt or 10 megawatts, and how you distribute that, you know, and if you look, you know, geographically, there's a lot of area, and the wind is blowing somewhere. The wind is always blowing somewhere. So, so what's, the, what's the right sizing? What's, where's the sweet spot? And it's probably you know, like a delta function. It's probably really tiny to fit that spot where, where it makes sense. Um, so as I mentioned before, one of the big challenges in wind is, is the status of our transmission distribution system. So, so this is um, there's this notion of curtailment. So that's when there's a mismatch between the wind, wind generating capability and either demand or the, the transmission capacity. And this is sort of a, a six month, and yes, the, the, the units are megawatts, so, that's, so they spilled three gigawatts 
I mean, that, that's three million homes could be powered with that. Some, some in that order. I mean, if you if you think of a of a kilowatt as being a typical home use. And and there are days when when it was matched, or maybe it was slow wind days, you know, here. But it's, it's you know it's episodic, and it, there's got to be a way. And the you know the wind providers get paid whether they're generating or not. They, and it depends on the purchase power agreement that gets set up. But that's so what they do in these days is this is these are green electrons that we're not utilizing. So on, on days like this, they will you know feather the blades so they spill the wind so they don't generate but they know what they could generate. And this is just out of ERCOT. So it's just that ERCOT is the, so the, the grid system in the U.S. is, in continental U.S. is three areas. It's east of the Mississippi, west of the Mississippi, and Texas. So ERCOT is really, it's just right there for, the, for their wind curtailment. So it's one little, one little area. So, it, I mean, so if there was a way, I'm going to go to the next. Yeah. So, so if there was a way to take advantage of this, it, it looks like there's almost like free power. I mean, the devil's in the details, but but there's got to be some way to take advantage of that. And, and so, um, so I it was in I think Feb so I've been working with with Dell and we put together a proposal to look at data centers and coupled with wind and stuff and. We submitted that to the Department of Energy. It, it wasn't selected for funding. I think they couldn't figure out what to do with it because it was stimulus money, and we didn't have any clear path to creating jobs. But it was responsive to the call to show energy-efficient computing. And then in uh, February, at a meeting in Seattle, I saw Burton Smith and um, talked to Burton and said, "Is there a way to, to, you know, is there any interest in Microsoft at this end? Instead of talking to the, the computer vendors, is there, you know?" on the cloud side of people who actually provide cloud computing is there some interest and so he put me in touch with, with Christian and, and Sean and so really I'm, I'm interested in can we create cloud friendly cloud computing you know can we can we do this in, in a different way and can we can we change the nature of cloud computing that, that fundamentally changes the total cost of ownership for the renewables and when you couple it with the cloud computing can you reinvent cloud computing can you reinvent the data center to you know, give it a net zero, you know, a, a carbon neutral footprint. And, it, and it's really, it's a hard thing because you've got to get your arms around so many different factors. There's, you know, IT costs. You have to drive the IT costs down so you're using really cheap commodity things. And the reliability, instead of setting up a lot of infrastructure with backup generators and UPS and, and you know, duplicate power supplies, can you get your reliability through redundancy rather than sort of five nines of reliability in your infrastructure. And again, that doing that and making that profitable will will depend on getting your IT costs down. Also from the wind side, you have you have to manage your, your peak demand, the capacity factor, curtailment, and interact almost, you know, on you know very short time frames with with utilities and no weather forecasting and you know it, it's it's a it's a it's a very fascinating challenge. Um, and one of the other things is, is shifting. So if your compute load, you know, is constant, like an HPC data center, I mean, I know, you know, jobs get queued up and they'll sit in the queue for 48 hours and, you know, we keep our systems running about 90 to 95% um, loaded. But on the IT side, can you, are there compute jobs, are there compute loads, whether it's, you know, Netflix or payroll or inventory or things that you can then shift around that are latency tolerance, you can manage your load and be responsive to fluctuations in wind generation or demand. Can you can you geographically move your load around, still get your job done? You know, complete what needs to be done compute-wise in this environment. So it it, it becomes a big you know software management issue, and and there's a high degree of uncertainty in all of this because we don't know. You know. The equations could change dramatically if there was a, some sort of change in electrical costs from you know either a carbon tax or cap and trade or carbon capture and sequestration technologies. We you know wind's fairly mature, but you know photovoltaics or I mean energy storage. I mean we haven't talked at all about that. I mean if if energy storage is is becomes solved at utility scale or if there's electrification of the 
you know, transportation system and we've got, you know, a million plug-in hybrids, I mean, the game can change dramatically. So finding that sweet spot and managing those things, you know, there's a real high degree of uncertainty. So it's, it's a huge challenge and it's really interesting. And with that, I, I think I'm done. But I, I, I like this picture because it just shows the, the sheer size of these systems. Um, with that, I'll, I'll wrap up and thank you. So I know um, GE manufactures turbines. We, we test them. Mike, do you know who else manufactures turbines? Does Siemens manufacture their own? I'm sorry. Yeah. Who manufactures the turbines? We've got, we've got one on site. We've got, I mean, the utility scale. Um, there's, we've got uh, Vestas, um, GE, Siemens. It's a big industrial companies for the, for the large, you know, the multi-megawatt. Yeah, we're about to get another three megawatt from Mesa on the side of here, too. So I, I looked at your carbon taxation number. That's, I, I, I need to get that slide. But when I look at it, the penalty is not high enough. Right? We have the uncertainty that will ever happen. So but if it happens, it's like a 10% added in cost to the electric bill. And so when companies look at that, they say, well, what are, what are we worried about? It's only going to be a 10% carbon tax if it happens. You know, in my mind, you almost look at it and you go, it has to do, they have to do a carbon taxation that's, you know, a, a doubling or a, right, something that catches people. Attention because 10% is just the well, that was, that was electrical. A, yeah, that was a scenario. I mean, in for example, in if you go to carbon capture and sequestration, it's between 25 and 30 percent of the electrical of the electricity generated then has to be used to scrub to, to capture the carbon dioxide. And and if we put in and that's just to capture it, so that's that's a you know minimum 20 to 25 to 30 percent increase there in your electrical costs. Then if you look at the infrastructure for the miles of pipe and where is it going to be stored, I mean, so, you know, it depends on the scenarios that, that you think are realistic. I think the penalty has to be high enough yeah. to get people's attention. I agree. Yeah, you talked a little bit about, you know, the power savings needed on gadgets and pipelines and things like that. Have you looked at the, you know, the kind of the watts per device impact on the infrastructure side that are always on base stations and how many watts per device that's infrastructure is taking up? I haven't, I haven't looked at that. That's a good, good question. So, and, so I, I mean, one of the things you, you prompted me to think, so we've got an Xbox at home. That thing heats up incredibly inside the little, you know, console. I'm like, gosh, why? I mean, we, so it's got a little, in our console underneath the TV, it's got, you know, glass doors, and the kids know they've got to open it up. Because <laughs> it's just, I mean, it's really hot. So, I mean, think of something that, that tends to be on a lot in our house. It's probably the, the one uh, sort of electronic device that gets used the most. And just, I'm not sure how much electricity it's actually using, but the fan is always going. It's always humming, and it, it just gets really warm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On that comment, uh, you said in your slides that one third of the of the power consumed in a home comes from the the people in the home, well, their in, practices. Well, like in a typical in a typical office yeah. building. So, so for example, uh, if you're going to use a computer just to browse, probably it's better to use a mobile device just to browse, because then you save like how much how much watts are using with this versus a laptop or a or a desktop. You have to do three times longer on this thing. But I don't care. <laughs> well, was, if, if, I, if I want to, if I if I want to do it because I want to save power, right. then I'd rather do it in, in my mobile device. Right. Right. And you doing. should also get rid of your 50-inch TV and just watch the movies on that. I don't watch TV actually. Please have to put the same reason. I'm not getting rid of it. So I mean, we've had we've had discussion about chargers and whether in the new building whether people are going to be allowed to have chargers to recharge their phone or BlackBerry. That discussion is still ongoing. They're looking at putting in some charging stations because of, again, solar 
you know, solar charging stations. So people would not have their own BlackBerry charger or, or iPhone charger right there that uses solar, solar charger. So does the EPA memory of show include the, um, the telecommunication industry? Or? Yes. Yeah, and I don't know what the, you know, how that divides out, whether it's mostly sort of IT or if it's talking, you know, I don't know whether it's 50-50 or 60-40, but, but it was it was inclusive. I don't know what the division is between the two. So do people like working in that building, or um, are you doing stuff like making charging stations where I can't charge it at my desk, like I always do? Do they, do they like it in that building, or are they, like, annoyed by all the things they have to do? So, I mean, it's a good question because so the folks who first went in there it's just it's very different okay um the offices are open so that we get air circulation so there aren't you know individual fan coils in offices or things that so it tends to have a very open atmosphere so some of the folks have been concerned about you know sort of audio privacy there are huddle rooms the closed walled offices are on the north side of the building so um, so the, the, it's largely, you know, open cubes with, you know, sort of an emphasis on collaborative space, an emphasis on nice, it's almost like a Frank Lloyd Wright philosophy of, of minimal personal space, but very well-appointed shared space. Okay, so there are huddle rooms with, you know, it may sound funny, but, but with a ceiling. So, so you do have a place you can go, so you have to make a personal phone call or something, you can go into the, into the huddle room. And, and do that, but sitting at your desk and you know, having a loud conversation, and, and that's probably the, the most common concern that I've heard raised is more along the lines of, you know, um, uh, Eric is just really loud, and this guy, Eric Talismanich, is just, he's just, his voice carries. I mean, he's just an animated guy. And so he's, he's in a walled office, even but in, when you're on a teleconference. So people just have to, uh, adapt a bit, but I haven't heard anybody, you know, say this isn't going to work, you know. It, it's different. And I think that the benefits of how things are structured actually, you know, you know, it's changed and some people are resistant to it, but I haven't heard anybody say that they really can't get their job done. In the office space, did you find you had to have a lot more square footage per inhabitant? because of the you know, need for more open airflow? No, no, no. When no. you go to Intel, you find you know, 40 square foot cubes. I think the standard for us is 72 square foot cubes. So I don't, I don't know. And walled off, you know, clinical walled offices. The walls are six foot, whatever. Six foot six, I think. And they're all on the north side. And I think they're 120 square foot. So it's, in our new building, when it's for connection, that would be the size of my office. And I've got 210 square feet now. I have to figure that out. Well, thank you again. <laughs>